Okay, we are. Okay, we're live. So let's go. Very good. Very good. Uh, bonjour tout le monde. <laughs> Bonjour à tous et bienvenue sur ce live streaming, cette conférence de la règle du jeu. Cette conférence sera exceptionnellement en anglais pour notre invité et euh, une traduction en sous-titres sera postée ultérieurement suite à la mise en ligne de la vidéo post-live. Exactly. So, here... Uh, I'm pleased to introduce our guest today for the sim of confinement, social media and democracy. He used to be general counsel for the Wikimedia Foundation and had been elected at the Open Source Initiative. He is currently serving at the Internet Society Board. Attorney and author, he is currently general counsel and director of innovation policy at the R Street Institute. Mostly famous for his Godwin's Law, I introduce Mike Godwin. How are you today? I, I, I'm good. I'm as good as we can be expected uh, in our in our moment of in our moments of or our interval of confinement. Uh, and uh, you know, it's a lovely day here in the Washington D.C. area. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I may venture out in a properly uh, socially distanced way uh, to shop later today. After <laughs> I think all friends is pretty much doing the same, <laughs> being serious and uh, safely home. Have you, yeah. Have you got me? We had a little bit of a freeze there, I think. Yeah. So uh, we're going to start about what you are most, most famous for, uh, meaning the Godwin's Law, or as you call it, JL, G, JL in English. So it's said as an online discussion continued as an online discussion continues, the probability of a comparison to Hitler or to Nazis approaches one. So you created this quote, uh, deliberately pseudo-scientific, in 1991, when the internet and the World Wide Web uh, has been created. Yes, I would say uh, that was in 1990 or before, uh, but 1991 is certainly an early uh, appearance of it. So the World Wide Web, the Internet as we know it, uh, has been only created by Tim Berners-Lee in uh, 1989. So my first question is, how did you do to come up with a timeless concept for the Internet within like only one year, a few, year, a few months of its existence? Uh, I think the answer is that um, prior to uh, uh, Tim uh, Berners-Lee uh, and his invention of the of the web, um, there were online environments throughout, the, even into the late 70s, but certainly throughout the 1980s. And I was very experienced with the dynamics that were emerging in the online forums. In my, uh, in my university town, Austin, Texas, many people who uh, were early computer hobbyists would connect many phone lines to their uh, computers and we would have these asynchronous uh, uh, conversations that were very much like what social media uh, uh, how social media operate today mm -hmm. and, and, and and what i saw was uh, and, and this still surprises me so many of the phenomena that we see uh, in, uh, in the online world of 2020 was right there in the online world of 1985 or 1990. So uh, I, I'm, I'm very familiar with a lot of the different uh, good and bad uh, experiences that people have online. But how did you come to get involved with that very early staged online world? Well, I so the the explanation was that I had uh, I had been in one uh, one or two different graduate degree programs at my university. I had already received an undergraduate degree, and uh, I was not happy in either of them. And I I was at loose ends, so I ended up. And I knew I liked having uh, access to computers because I'm a writer and. Having your own word processing at home was uh, essential uh, for me. Uh, I never really mastered the old uh, 
of typewriters, but I, now I type very fast. Uh -huh. uh, but, but when I, in order to fund a purchasing a, 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 a personal computer in, in order to write uh, articles and such, I got a job learning about computers. So essentially I taught myself, um, I taught myself basic computers. And, and as an undergraduate, I had studied philosophy and logic. So in some ways, I, I'm one of the few who was able to leverage uh, philosophical undergraduate training into practical <laughs> application. <laughs> because once you have, uh, you know, once you have, uh, you know, studied uh, uh, Wittgenstein, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you know, I mean, honestly, uh, computer programming languages and operating systems are quite straightforward. Mm -hmm. So, so, so when you say it was the internet at its beginning and that you could already observe that the law was applicable and has not, is still applicable today. I've lost you a little bit. I'm sorry, I've lost you a little bit, but go ahead. And internet at its beginning, and then I didn't hear what you said. Ever. Like your law, your principle being applicable oh. at the early stage of the internet, where only a few oh. users were connected and it's still applicable right. no, today no, with billion. So it's not the number of people involved <laughs> that makes no. the law applicable. That, that's correct. It was, uh, so these were the people who were using uh, computer communications in the middle 1980s were very far ahead of the curve. Uh, and they, but I could see certain social dynamics emerging. And one of them was that I literally did observe how many occasions uh, on how many occasions people would escalate their rhetoric to comparing others to uh, Nazis or to Hitler. Um, and, and, and this was quite troubling to me because eventually I went to law school and I was studying uh, international law and war crimes law. And I, I, took the, I took World War II and the rise of fascism and authoritarianism very seriously. And it troubled me that the rhetoric was so cheap when the topic was so serious. Uh -huh. uh, and so I tried, I thought about it for a year or two and tried to think of what, you know, what can one person do uh, in an online environment of any size to affect this course. Yeah. And, and uh, I had uh, come across a discussion of memes uh, which was an idea invented by uh, Richard Dawkins. And I said, why don't I try to craft a meme so that instead of trying to pour a lot of energy and capital into changing the culture, I could come up with an idea that was sufficiently attractive and self-propagating that, uh, that it would not need me, <laughs> that it would just get out there in the world and propagate itself. So. Uh, ironically, we're here. We are confined because of a virus, a mimetic virus that I tried to create. That's true. Uh, years ago. So, it's uh, less famous, less known, even if it's uh, at, on the description of your Twitter account. But you have actually a second law. It states that surveillance. I, I kind of love it. But it's surveillance is the crack cocaine of governments. And that's kind of a scary one. So what about this one and, and the first one? Sure. Well, I think that uh, one of the things that uh, one of the challenges I have uh, and every, from time to time is people say, well, you came up with Godwin's Law. We came up with G GL. What is your next thing? And I said, well, I don't know. You know, I, I think uh, and I had different ideas about what, you know, what I could do that was clever enough. But in my uh, professional work as an attorney, I deal with uh, computer security and surveillance and limits on government action. And if you study wiretapping and uh, interception and you look at the governments around the world, including uh, yours and mine, which have anxiety about mm -hmm. encryption, uh, you see that there's this really pre-rational idea that if governments can't engage in surveillance, uh, all chaos will be unleashed. Um, and, 
you know, for most of human history, governments did not have the capacity to surveil people in any efficient or massive way. I mean, uh, you know, Easter, East Germany uh, famously did it super inefficiently, uh, but pervasively, uh, and, 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 and that surveillance state sort of collapsed. Yes. But now, of course, uh, digital technologies make surveillance easier. And uh, the way it is talked about by government officials who are either law enforcement officials or intelligence uh, agency officials is this is something we absolutely need. We dare not allow a world in which we cannot guarantee being able to surveil, spy on uh, potential criminals or malicious actors of various sorts. And the way they talk about it in terms of their need is the way that addicts talk about their substances. Um, and so that was uh, where I came up with uh, my second law. So all the, uh, the tracking from the phones against the coronavirus, the drones patrolling in the streets to make sure people are not out, all the systems are going to increase, in your opinion? Well, I think that certainly when you look at the People's Republic of China, uh, you are looking uh, at a combination of pervasive surveillance plus their social uh, credit system uh, so that they are actually building a government sponsored social credit database. And once you become, uh, you know, an undesirable person in some way that gets used against you. And I find that quite uh, horrifying. And now that's an authoritarian government. Uh, and so it's easier uh, to implement those kinds of uh, constraints in a government that values individual privacy and liberty a lot less. But in, 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 the, uh, uh, in the Western democracies and in other democracies around the world, there are also uh, uh, government forces that argue in favor of surveillance, of increasing surveillance capability, and they typically frame their need for surveillance in terms of threats, which when the threats are either crime or, uh, you know, enemy action, basically. And, uh, and uh, they uh, push the buttons of uh, people's inchoate fears about, you know, about the other. About, uh, so, okay, the story repeating, repeating itself, but with new ways of technology. So uh, this is kind of a, top, a forgotten topic, but it was um, uh, a lot of ink flooded uh, on net neutrality when Trump accessed power. Um, in France, the debate is, is net neutrality is still on, as in many countries. But people, I think, already forgot that net neutrality is not a principle anymore in the U.S. To uh, for all people listening to us, it's the idea that a provider has to treat everybody, uh, every client, every company, every, every individual uh, as equal regarding the, the internet uh, debit and flow. Um, so net neutrality, fake news, online surveillance, confinement is said to bring more people together, but some challenges seem reinforced. So which is, in your opinion, the biggest one? for now and the upcoming weeks well I, I okay so let me walk through you we've now you've now given us several topics to touch on so i'll try in, to indeed uh, <laughs> do, uh, do uh, a comprehensive response um the 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 net neutrality issue is one in which uh, i i take uh, a, a more nuanced view because uh, there are engineering constraints and capacity constraints that may affect whether you want to treat all information uh, the same. Uh, and in fact, one of the things that we know is that the internet infrastructures of most countries will treat some kinds of packets differently from other kinds so that 
if you are if you're watching a video streaming service your service may well have uh, paid for uh, some kind of greater capacity uh, it's true with the infrastructure so so that and most of us don't really think that's oppressive what we think is oppressive is the possibility that the companies maintaining the underlying infrastructure will use their power to privilege their corporate interests over those of competitors. And that, I think, is a valid concern. So I, I think some forms of regulation regarding fairness uh, from the infrastructure companies is required. Uh, but then there are questions about whether that should be simple or nuanced. And, and here I would add one other thought, which is this. In the developed democracies, we all have lots of very capacious internet pipelines. But in uh, developing countries where there are not so many uh, legacy telephone systems with wires in the ground, or wires on poles, uh, they're making the leap to internet access directly to mobile devices, which have yes. different, uh, different constraints on them. Africa so mostly, yeah. Africa, absolutely Africa, and much of Asia as well. True. And even, and even perhaps in South America as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, the question uh, then becomes, how do you bootstrap or how do you in, uh, incentivize demand for broadband in these underserved populations if they never get to sample what broadband is? Why would they care, you know? Uh, if they if, if they think they don't need anything more than voice telephony and SMS texting, why would they care? You know, if they can, you know, how fast their web page is slow. Well, it matters a lot. You know, this particular uh, discussion that we're having requires uh, uh, a broadband. It just requires it. And so uh, we would, and I think that people uh, uh, recognize the value of using these video conferencing systems, especially now now that people are more uh, confined. My wife is from Cambodia, and her uh, country has, uh, her, uh, her homeland has original, uh, has big bandwidth in the cities, but not so much in the provinces. And uh, she has family all over. So to the extent that we can let her video conference with her family, it, it, it makes it easier for my in-laws to tolerate her being on the other side of the world. This makes a lot of sense. <laughs> but so, the... That's on net neutrality, but let me talk about, I guess you want to, let's talk about monitoring. Um, you know, I took my, I'm now in the habit of taking my temperature uh, every day because I want to be alert to whether I have a fever emerging, right? True. And uh, the service, the, the, I use a Kinsa thermometer, which actually reports high temp. you know, it gathers a bunch of data that supposedly is anonymized, uh, that they, so they can actually see emergent patterns of more fever or something like that. Oh. And, and that is one thing that we think probably has some social good associated with it. But also, I think the, the privacy implications are quite frightening. Uh, because you can always make a social a benefit argument for more monitoring. You always can. Uh, but if but we think that human I think we think that human autonomy requires a certain amount of uh, control over sharing that information with governments and with companies and with everyone else. So I was also mentioning fake news between net neutrality and online okay. surveillance. But even if <laughs> those are separate topics and, and we can take each and discuss for hours about every single one of them. Uh, they're still all together connected through the internet and the digital world. And, and so what I'd like to know, uh, what is your opinion about the, what is the biggest challenge right now for population? What should be the most concerned about? Is it actually the net neutrality because everybody needs to be connected online? Are those fake news, which are increasing when people are confined, or is it online surveillance? It's like the feeling that maybe sometime we need to give up one <laughs> for the other to be more to emerge more. So, 
I would say that in order of concern for me from least to most, I would say the net neutrality issues, which I think are, 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 are definitely real issues, are the least important. The next more important is uh, uh, the ability of governments and others to engage in deeper and more comprehensive surveillance. And the third one, which is a really hard problem to solve, is fake news, uh, or what we'll call fake news yeah. as a convenient term. And the difficulty here is that um, in the internet, the internet has given us a very rich uh, resource full of information uh, sources, uh, many of which are not reliable. Uh, and and uh, because it's disintermediated, uh, um, the, the, the relationship between the consuming information, consuming public, and these sources, it's certainly possible for uh, disinformation operations to take place. And even just, and, and here I mean disinformation in terms of deliberately misleading the public. Mm -hmm. Also, or just deliberately manipulating the public. Uh, but also misinformation. I mean, things like uh, concern about whether ibuprofen is bad for COVID-19 patients uh, you know, yeah there's there are lots of there's misinformation is out there too and the difficulty here i believe is a fundamentally philosophical problem because uh, we have not treated it as a priority in any of the developed nations that every citizen needs to uh, acquire some degree of critical rationalism uh, where critical rationalism, I mean the ability to ask yourself of any information source, how do I know this is true? What, are, what happens if this is false? How do I test what I think might be true? The, the human habit with information generally is confirmation bias. You know, I think that girl likes me, and uh, she said something, she smiled my way. I'm pretty sure it means she wants me to go talk to her. And in fact, I'm just lying to myself. In fact, she smiled socially. She doesn't, she's not interested in talking to me, but I'm reading it and interpreting it as confirmation of my bias. That's a very natural human phenomenon. But in, in, in a world full of information sources of all sorts, uh, it, it becomes easy if we are predisposed to uh, confirm our worst fears. It becomes easy to search the internet and find something that seems to justify our conspiracy theories or our extreme political beliefs or uh, other kinds of antisocial activity or even self-destructive activity. Um, and, and this is hard. I think that we have a massive species-wide obligation to begin to teach everyone uh, uh, something like critical rationalism, something like, you know, some kind of at least basic epistemology and, 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 and philosophy of science, because otherwise uh, we are unusually vulnerable as a species to uh, misinformation and false ideas and confirmation bias. I mean, it takes discipline to overcome that. And that's gonna, I believe very strongly that that requires a programmatic response, not merely uh, a kind of a individual moral choice. I think we have to think about it as a social problem. Well, <laughs> and do you think the incoming months are, um on a political aspect, things might get, might get back to normal. Uh, I mean, I, I like to think that um, the political incursion to the extremes are like waves. Like some people said that uh, Obama was elected thanks to the fact that Bush made so many mistakes and Trump has probably been elected because we are the first black president in the United States and now we have someone far to the extreme. Maybe after Trump, someone more moderate might come. I'm summing it up 
by a lot, but could the idea be that things will evolve after being worse, but they need to be worse because before improving? Are you, are you there? Well, yeah. I, I think that the question that you're asking is is something that has a, a, a deep history. Yes, here. You were slow. Uh, there was a bandwidth problem, and so I had to wait until all your bits crossed the Atlantic uh, to my computer. But now I've heard you. So um, the uh, I think what you're really talking about is... Um, is, uh, uh, hold on one moment. I think what you're talking about is a historicism because what happens is we, you know, human beings have liked, have enjoyed looking at history and trying to see what patterns emerge. What maybe we're gonna have a time of social liberalism at some point and then another time of repression or we'll have a time of enlightenment followed by a time of, you know, ignorance or prejudice uh, but even that uh, cyclic, uh, these various cyclic theories are reassuring because they suggest that it's like the tide. You know, it's just a natural phenomenon that you can anticipate. Uh, I think that's true. Um, the reason I don't think it's true is that uh, we, you know, we don't live in the, you know, culture progresses in new ways all the time. We. The, 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 the internet and its cultural impact is unprecedented uh, in human history. Mm -hmm. And uh, you uh, asked me about my uh, tweet about the fact that you actually have a billion, you know, a, a few billion people responding more or less uh, collaboratively and collectively in response to uh, the coronavirus yes. uh, pandemic. And, and that's, we couldn't have, have, ever have had that with previous mass media. That was impossible. Uh, and now uh, getting the message out uh, was relatively straightforward. If you think about the kind of mobilization among the general population that we had, uh, at least uh, in, 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 in half the world over the last two months, it's astonishing. Um, and... Uh, it, it, I, I think we're going to spend, I, I know that I'm going to spend the rest of my life, and you may end up spending the rest of your life, analyzing this particular historical moment and trying to understand exactly what we're experiencing here. So that, so I think that there are not cycles. I think it's more often, that it's not like we're going round and round in cycles. It's more often that there's some spiral up or some spiral down or spiral sideways uh, so, so that things seem cyclic if you look at it in a certain perspective, but in fact, they're actually progressing collectively into uh, totally new places. Um, and so I don't understand, I think that, I wouldn't understand uh, Trump, I'll just tell you with regard to the Trump's election, I think in some sense there were uh, um, sort of chaos theory type, uniquely unpredictable events that shape that outcome. But apart from that, um, the uh, I think that we were still seeing uh, in the developed nations that had survived the 2008 financial crisis, a general unhappiness among the, the general populations uh, because the economic recovery had not benefited them in the ways that it had benefited people Yes. In the top uh, tiers, and this is, and this is why I think, for example, uh, uh, Thomas Piketty's uh, uh, e economic theories are quite useful because they're reminding us that if you are controlling capital in a certain way, it doesn't mean your your, your accumulation of capital doesn't mean that you are necessarily investing in in the general welfare. It may just be that you have an advantage that that you that no one will ever catch up to. I think that's an important, uh, that raises important questions, uh, possibly questions. Um, and uh, so that is, so for example, I, I think that uh, if you look at the economic unhappiness uh, in the United States, and the United States did not have the worst of the uh, economic crisis in 2008, some other nations did. Um, and you look in the United Kingdom as well, 
what you see is that uh, discontent is manifesting itself in in uh, xenophobia uh, and a desire for politicians who will come in and shake everything up and change everything in the hope that at least uh, there's some chance that it will improve uh, everybody's uh, outlook toward uh, economic well-being in the future. So uh, that brings us back to the fact that there is the welfare, but about the feeling of the crisis uh, moving on. Uh, why, in a global crisis, do, do, does the world seem more in the same time, but less global? Everybody's locked in. Everybody's facing the same issue. Everybody has to respond like never the world has been uh, so humane and humanity has been so facing each other as being facing the same trouble. We all get the virus regardless of religion, origin, ethnic, and at the same time closing border, some country is trying to say it does not affect us. So why in a global crisis does the world seem more but less global? Well, I, I think that, um, I, I think that uh, one of the difficulties that we have in response to a pandemic is that uh, if there is a, a, a kind of a global social or economic uh, shakeup, generally it, it's possible for people to easily take the streets and say, all right, well, we're going or to, or to shape the outcomes of elections. But here, uh, at this particular historical moment, if we all went out to the streets, yes. or you know, if we all protest in Tahrir Square, um, we will give each other diseases. So that's not, that's suboptimal. <laughs> you know, if you want to have a, a social <laughs> progress or a revolution, get, making everybody else sick is not, uh, is not recommended. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> agreed on that. <laughs> so, so we're in this odd moment of realizing that we can coordinate uh, uh, and, we, and we can communicate with one another uh, and share an experience, and I think that's ultimately going to be quite positive. But at the same time, uh, even in my own uh, fairly diverse uh, uh, social media feed, I'm coming across people who are pretty certain that the Chinese invented uh, the coronavirus, you know, being united in our confinement. Uh, so in France, it's... Uh, it's... In this moment, does not, is not programmatic. So, so, not, so, so, sorry to uh, cut you here. No, that's all right. It, it's not programmatic, but you have to cut me off. <laughs> no, me uh, no. When you say China will be at the origin of the virus in France, it's even worse because the previous minister, uh, health minister, is married to a son of Simon Vell, mm -hmm. very famous politician. She went through the war. And she focused a lot on anti-Semitism. And I saw fake... I know her as a Simone Biles. Exactly. Right? Yeah. <laughs> the... Exactly. So I saw a lot of uh, documents, fake stuff online. The previous health minister saying that they had a conflict of interest and that they were the source with China for the worldwide virus. His name is Levi if you had wondered. So it's not only the Chinese, it will also, of course, be the Jews. So okay. that, um, yeah. Well, I, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not, you know, I literally have almost no useful information to <laughs> add to the longstanding questions of French uh, uh, anti-Semitism. You know, we have our own varieties in the United States. <laughs> Obviously. But I, I'm not surprised to see that emerge, and then certainly, uh, as you mentioned, I have seen uh, I have seen uh, anti-Semitic uh, 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 ideas being promoted uh, in, in in Anglophone mm -hmm. media. Yeah. So, so I've seen it. It's definitely out there. And and here once again, I think the impulse is to seek a simple explanatory theory uh, that somehow reorders a disorder. Uh, and so, uh, as you uh, as you know, um, you know, with uh, 
you know, we, I think you mentioned uh, in our earlier discussion, uh, Hannah Arendt and uh, Wilhelm Reich. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, there's the, I think there's this idea that um, you were able to channel some energy into, uh, which might be, you know, orgone energy, that might be something else, the, in, into uh, 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 vilifying the other. And I think people like the ordering principle of being able to identify an enemy. Uh, at least if you know who the enemy is, then, you know, then the mission is clear. You must defeat the enemy. Uh, but in fact, uh, we are li living in a world that is uh, uh, fractally complex. It is uh, extraordinarily complex. And we have to not look to our natural desire to have a simple theory that explains it. And, you know, Honestly, if, if human beings acted consistent with simple theories, we would all have 100% uh, histories of 100% happy relationship, you know, partners and family, <laughs> because we could figure it all out, right? Of course. Uh, <laughs> you know, and we'd all know who to vote for. It would be the one person that was obvious for 100% of the voters was the best. <laughs> but in fact, human beings are complex. And... Uh, and we have to uh, we have to we have to learn to resist our tendency to oversimplify, uh, you know, uh, our, our political systems. Yeah, it reminds me of Arendt actually. Um, what what is politic? And uh, saying politics is actually when people are more than one, because one person by itself, it's pretty simple to organize and to live. But the systemic organization requires complexity uh, in itself. So uh, 